I'd just like to say, uh, I'm going to read a little bit of a bio here. Um, you do understand that we're very privileged to have, as our guest speaker this evening, uh, Joseph H. Taylor, Professor Joseph H. Taylor, who in 1993 won a Nobel Prize for physics, okay, that he shared with Russell Hulse. Um, what I'm going to read, which is an abbreviated uh, bio, is from uh, Les Prix Nobel from 1993. All right, and uh, please excuse me, I am going to be you for a little bit. All right, I was born March 29th, 1941, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the second son of Houghton Taylor and Sylvia Evans Taylor. When I was seven, we moved back to the family farm in Cinnaminson Township, New Jersey. New Jersey. All right, then operated by my paternal grandfather. We were three children, joined later by three more, plus two Evans cousins. Like the farm's peaches and tomatoes, the eight of us grew and ripened in a healthy and carefree environment on the eastern bank of the Delaware River. Among my fondest boyhood memories are collecting stone arrowheads left on the land by its much earlier inhabitants and erecting, together with my brother Hal, numerous large rotating ham radio antennas high above the roof of the three-story Victorian farmhouse. With one such project, we managed to shear off the brick chimney flush to the roof, <laughs> much to the consternation of our parents. That incident was many, one of many practical lessons of my youth, not all absorbed in the most timely fashion, involving ill-advised shortcuts towards some goal. All right. In our uh, school years, Hal and I filled more of the third floor with our working ham radio transmitters and receivers. Our rigs were mostly built from a mixture of post-war surplus equipment and junk television sets, familiar. We learned by experience that when you need high voltage, the power company's 6,000 to 120 volt transformers worked admirably in reverse. And that most, and that most amplifiers will oscillate, especially if you don't want them to. I was educated mostly at Quaker institutions, in particular Morristown Friends School and Haverfond College. In school, mathematics was my first academic love. Somewhat backward high school in introduction to chemistry and physics, I failed to recognize them as such at the time, did not dampen my any enthusiasm for science. They just gave me more time for sports than a great passion. Soccer, basketball, baseball, golf, and tennis claimed much of my energy through the Haverford years. Concurrently, though, I began discovering the delights of what science is really about. A fascinating senior honors project in physics allowed me to combine a working knowledge of radio frequency electronics with an awakening appreciation of a scientific inquiry and to build a working radio telescope. My principal reference were an old friend, the Radio Amateur's Handbook and an early book on radio astronomy by Pawsey and Braswell. This thoroughly enjoyable honors project cannot really qualify as research. Everything I accomplished had been done by others years before, but it provided excellent lessons in problem solving of various kinds. It also delivered a valid reason for selecting something I had been hoping to find, a desirable field of physics in which to pursue graduate studies. My academic work in the Harvard Department of Astronomy, Physics, and Applied Mathematics was the hardest I ever remember working. At least during my first year there, I suppose every beginning graduate student feels the same way. Something to prove, anyway. I certainly did. But my thesis research in radio astronomy was once again thoroughly enjoyable. Now, amateur radio. Joe Taylor first obtained his amateur radio license as a teenager, which led him to the field of radio astronomy. Taylor is well known in the field of amateur radio, weak signal communication, and was assigned the call signs K1JT by the FCC. He had previously held the call signs K21TP, WA1LXQ, W1HFV, and FK2BJK, the latter being in Australia. 
His amateur radio feats have included mounting an expedition in April of 2010 to use the Arecibo radio telescope to conduct moon bounce with amateurs around the world using voice, Morse code, and digital communications. He wrote several computer programs and communication protocols, including WSJT, Weak Signal, Joe Taylor, a software package and protocol suit suite that utilizes computer-generated messages in conjunction with radio transceivers to communicate over long distances with other amateur radio operators. WSJT is useful for passing short messages via non-traditional radio communication methods, such as moon bounce and meteor scatter and other low signal-to-noise ratio paths. It is also useful for extremely long-distance contacts using very low power transmissions. And this is the man who is going to address us this evening. So please, a warm welcome for Professor Joe Taylor. So uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. And, and uh, uh, I've been looking forward to coming down and looking at the museum as well as uh, meeting all you uh, interesting folks. Uh, I think all of us probably had an early interest in radio one way or another, uh, and many of us go back um, uh, probably about as many years as I do in the, in the 1950s when uh, we all had a lot of fun uh, putting together uh, equipment that, as you just heard in that brief uh, autobiographical sketch, uh, you could do in those days out of uh, parts that you could get in the local dump and think places like that. So, uh, I mean, Richard said something about this uh, fun time that we had putting the 1,000-foot uh, diameter Arecibo radio telescope on the air for moon bounce, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Uh, if you'd like to ask me some questions about it, I'd be happy to. What I am going to talk about is this, uh, um, it's certainly not antique radio, this is 21st century radio using uh, digital communication techniques. Uh, and. Um, I'll, I'll try to put it in context for all of you. I, I did see a, a show of hands earlier from uh, of people at the uh, Antique Radio Club uh, members who uh, also have ham call signs. But uh, just as an overall, everybody in the room, those of you who have a ham call sign, let's, let's see a show of hands. OK, so ha half or so, maybe a little bit more than half, I guess. Uh, because I'm going to probably use some ham jargon. And if I'm using that kind of jargon that doesn't make sense to some of you, uh, yell out or something, or ask me uh, to, to interpret when necessary. Um, so, um, oh, I guess I gotta turn something on here, to make this work. Uh, here's a quick overview of, of what I wanted to cover, uh, if, if uh, there's sufficient time. First, a little bit of background and fundamentals. Um, that I, I really want to uh, emphasize the uh, communication theory that is behind uh, this software that I've been writing. and. Uh, Distributing, uh, it's free for download on the on the web, uh, and thousands of people around the world are using it. Uh, but then I want to tell you a little bit in detail about the various different uh, uh, communication protocols that are embedded in that uh, uh, different versions of that software. Uh, one protocol designed specifically for communication by reflection from the ionized trails left by meteors. So that's at very high frequencies, and, and it's uh, using this so-called meteor scatter technique. Then at, at VHF and even higher frequencies, ultra-high frequencies, uh, there is this uh, communication technique where you basically use the moon as a, re as a passive reflector. Uh, that, of course, is, uh, there's a lot of history about that right here. Uh, Project Diana back in 1946 when I was five years old, so I didn't know about it at the time, but uh, uh, here they were, uh, guys from Camp Evans uh, bouncing signals off the moon and getting reflections. Uh, it, it's uh, fun to do that today, and it turns out it's a challenging thing for ham radio operators to do because it's possible with uh, uh, sort of power limits that regulatory authorities put on hams and the uh, kind of antennas that you can put up without your wife having too much of a conniption about what you've built in the backyard, that sort of thing. So it's possible, but only barely possible, and so it's fun if you can do it. Okay. Uh, moon bounce uh, communication is often referred to as EME, Earth, Moon, Earth. So you'll see that acronym EME 
uh, on a number of these slides. And uh, hams actually even have an annual contest where you get on the air and try to communicate with as many other hams as possible, all by means of Earth, Moon, Earth communication. So you can't work the guy in the next town unless you both point your antennas at the moon and make sure that you've got the Doppler shift and everything so you're not actually getting uh, his signal from the, just across the, uh, by the ordinary means. Um, then there's a, a communication mode that is uh, rather different from the others. You're not making two-way communications, but you're actually uh, uh, sending out a sort of quasi-beacon signal. Uh, and uh, I call this the weak signal propagation reporter, WSPR. Uh, it's nice because you can pronounce that as whisper. And we talk about whispering around the world. You can use very low power and uh, detect your signal halfway around the world. Somebody else said it may, may detect it there. And uh, the, the software is set up so that it posts a, a message when it detects a signal at a, uh, at a website. And uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, the web uh, site puts together a map of where all the uh, open communication paths are. Um, uh, then there is uh, a, a protocol made for high frequency uh, weak signal uh, communications. It's when you know, hams do things like trying to work in many different countries as possible. That's referred to as DXing. DX stands for distance. Um, and uh, then I'll say just a few things about uh, things that are going on most recently. So anyway, that's, that's the basic idea. So let me uh, start here back in about uh, 15 years ago, not quite, uh, when I got uh, re-interested in ham radio. I had been fascinated by it as a boy, uh, as you just heard in that little autobiographical sketch. Together with my brother, we, we built a lot of stuff as teenagers. But, you know, then I went off to college and, and graduate school and married and had kids and, and a lot of other responsibilities. And although I did keep my license active during all those years, I was not uh, on the air very often. Um, I uh, discovered when I got back into it again 35 years later, I hadn't lost my Morse code proficiency. I was still <laughs> good at that. And it's sort of like riding a bike. If you do it when you're young, you, do, you don't lose it. Uh, so I got back into those things, and I began to think of ways in which I could bring uh, some of the techniques that I had learned uh, in my professional research in uh, astrophysics, radio astronomy, um, where we deal with very weak signals and try to extract uh, interesting information about quasars, pulsars, the state of the universe, and so forth, from uh, very weak signals in the, in the presence of a, of a significant background noise. And I wanted to sort of see how those techniques could be brought more into uh, ham radio than has typically been the case before. Um, so uh, what I was thinking of were, were, in particular, ways of doing either meteor scatter communication, because that's kind of hard to do, or moon bounce communication, because that's definitely hard to do, at the lowest possible uh, signal levels. That is, it's things that you could do with a perfectly ordinary uh, ham radio station. Now, there are, you know, if you think about it as an engineering problem, there are a lot of uh, constraints and trade-offs that you uh, can imagine you might uh, be thinking about as you design such a system. Uh, transmitter power um, is expensive, uh, and anyway, we're limited. Uh, hams in this, in this country can transmit up to 1,500 watts, and that's it. So if uh, that's enough, fine. If it's not enough, uh, then you're out of luck or you have to build a bigger antenna or some other thing to, uh, to get around the problem. Uh, in general, uh, bandwidth uh, on the ham radio bands is a limited resource and you cannot use arbitrary amounts of bandwidth. So uh, typically on the very high frequency bands, uh, enough bandwidth is usually available, but still uh, narrow is good. If you broadcast a signal that takes up a lot of bandwidth, you're ham radio neighbors are going to be annoyed with you and so forth. So narrow is, is generally a, a good approach. And I was not uh, interested in uh, using so-called spread spectrum techniques, which also have interesting applications, but are not very well uh, adopted into the general uh, kinds of uses of the uh, frequency bands that are allocated to uh, ham radio operators. I wanted to make it possible that um, you could do these things, whatever was going to go into the system, with uh, the standard radios that typical ham radio operators have today. They have limited, you know, the stability is pretty good. Uh, you set the dial to a frequency and it stays on that frequency pretty well, but it's not perfect. And I didn't want to have to uh, insist that the quality of the oscillators be such that it was comparable to laboratory standards, say, or something like that. 
I wasn't interested especially in, um, uh, sorry, in uh, techniques that would um, require uh, a contact, a, a so-called QSO, that's just a, a, a abbreviated signal for uh, contact between two different stations. I didn't want that to uh, require a uh, very long integration time so that your contact of exchange of some information takes two weeks or something like that. You know, that, that has been done on certain occasions just because it's kind of fun to see what you can do, but I was interested in things that you could do in a few minutes or 10 minutes or something, say much less than an hour anyway. Uh, and so that was another kind of limit. Now, it was clear that since I was talking about different kinds of propagation paths, including a reflection from very short uh, duration um, ionized meteor trails and, and these very weak signals that come back from the moon, uh, it was clear that there were going to be necessarily different uh, uh, protocols or different uh, modulation schemes, different uh, overall designs, uh, depending on what the uh, uh, propagation model would be. So each purpose is going to have its own special needs. So uh, what other things can you play with, as, uh, imagining yourself as a, as a design engineer here? You can uh, imagine dealing with the data rate. Uh, faster is good, maybe, but uh, it may not always suit the, the solution to the problem very well. Uh, the total throughput is uh, an important uh, constraint. I was interested in uh, simple messages that would Allow, enable two operators to exchange their call signs and a signal report and maybe a little bit of other information, but not uh, long conversations. So we're talking about minimal exchanges of information, uh, enough that you can uh, say that you actually exchange some unknown information with the other guy and you can, with good conscience, exchange these little postcards that hams like to send out. Uh, with your call sign on it and uh, confirm that the, uh, that the contact was made, but uh, we're not talking about sitting down and chewing the rag for uh, half an hour at a time or something. So um, there's various kinds of uh, encoding that's going to be put onto the messages. Uh, the information will be compressed, uh, but then in order to do, that you can exchange information without uh, errors, there's going to have to be built in some error control uh, uh, coding. Um, this was fascinating for me to learn because I didn't know anything about it as I was starting out this. I sort of knew vaguely that such codes existed, but I didn't know much about how they worked. So that was fun to learn and, and design into the, into the software. Um, then we have a, a choice of how much bandwidth we're going to use and what modulation scheme we're going to impose upon the, uh, the signal to carry the information. Uh, we're going to have to uh, deal with whether the receiver and the transmitter need to be synchronized in some way so that the receiver knows when a message starts and uh, sort of can get things decoded in the right order, all that kind of stuff. Um, Richard, tell me, if I move this sideways, is that going to be a problem? I can push it. Yeah, great. That'll be a little bit less in my way then. Great, thanks. Okay, so that's sort of the background. Um, Again, I want to optimize the capability for making minimal exchanges of information uh, to complete these things that Ham call, HAMS call QSOs. Uh, let's think uh, separately about at least two of the possible um, communication schemes that I was interested in. One was this uh, scheme of meteor scatter where you uh, have a, working on a, on a frequency, say, uh, the amateur two meter band at 144 megahertz, a, a bit above the uh, uh, commercial uh, FM band. Uh, so signals ordinarily travel, what, 50 miles, 100 miles? Uh, if you can get down into the noise, maybe a couple hundred miles, but that's it. And uh, ionospheric reflections don't work at those frequencies. So if you want to exchange, uh, make a contact with another station, say, a thousand miles away, uh, on those frequencies, you're out of luck most of the time, except that uh, fairly <coughs> often there will be a meteor entering the Earth's atmosphere somewhere around halfway between the two of you, and that ionizes the atmosphere for a brief time with a uh, high enough electron density in the ionized gas to cause a brief reflection of the signal. And sure enough, uh, you do get a reflection of a signal even from amateur power levels of 100 watts or so. Uh, but it tends to last for a few tenths of a second at best. So in order to 
have any communication capability, you would better be sending uh, your information at a high rate, 100 characters per second or so, so that even in, say, two tenths of a second, what do you get then? 20 characters. Well, that's enough for my call sign and your call sign and your signal report and my name maybe just to uh, introduce myself, that sort of stuff. So that's, that's basically the idea. And I wanted to be sure that this would work down to a signal to noise ratio uh, right at the threshold of the noise level. Uh, with a standard ham transceiver, which has a bandwidth of, a, of maybe two and a half kilohertz, I wanted the total amount of uh, reflected signal uh, in that band pass to be roughly equal to the noise power so that you could just barely hear it maybe, uh, but we wanted to be able to communicate with that. Now the EME, the moon bounce problem, is a different one uh, in a number of ways. In the first place, the signal is uh, more or less predictable in, in amplitude. Uh, it's always there. If the, if the moon's above your horizon and it's above the horizon at the other station that you'd like to contact, the distance is always almost the same. It doesn't vary that much. And so you should get back a certain amount of signal. The bad news is <laughs> the amount is very low. There's a 250 dB, more or less, uh, attenuation of, along that path. So you'd better have uh, a fairly big antenna that'll concentrate your power on the moon. You better have as much power as you can afford to put together and so forth. And you'd better have a very sensitive receiver and hope that you can get down to copy a signal level much lower than what you could hear even. Now, uh, the signal to noise ratios that I'll quote here are all quoted in the same units uh, in decibels of, of uh, ratio of power relative to the noise, oops, sorry again, pressing the wrong button here, relative to the noise in a fixed bandwidth of 2,500 hertz. So uh, the effort here was to design a signal that would work at signal to noise ratio of something like 20 dB below the noise level. Uh, now, that means that the signal is actually too weak to hear, although you can actually hear down to, uh, if, a, if the signal is just a pure tone of a constant carrier, you can hear down to something like minus 10, minus 12, minus 15 dB, because your ear is a good filter, and it has an effective bandwidth of maybe only a couple hundred hertz instead of 2,500 hertz. That ratio of bandwidth is already a factor of 10. That means that you're already down to 10 dB, and if you're good and a trained operator can hear down to something like 15 dB on this scale. But still, I wanted it to work even with signals that are too weak to hear uh, by at least another 5 or 10 dB, maybe more. Um, is everybody familiar with dBs when I'm talking about them? A, a 10 dB is a factor of 10 in power and so forth. Okay, so let's, let's carry on. So there's this, uh, I mean, Richard mentioned the name of this software, WSJT, I just couldn't think of a better name, I guess. Weak signal communication was what it was about, and my call sign and my initials and so forth to make up the rest of it. Um, so it's a computer program, and it brings these new ideas that I've been referring to into ham radio. It requires a standard uh, 21st century or late 20th century uh, single sideband transceiver. Um, have it fairly stable is good. Um, and then you use a computer with a sound card, or virtually all computers now have an audio input and audio output jack. And uh, you basically interface that to the receiver so that your transceiver sends an audio signal output which goes into the computer uh, and uh, so forth. There are currently now thousands of users of this software, and I'll, t I'll show you just a few of the uh, ways in which they're, they're used. Uh, now, let me mention again these different operating protocols or modes. Uh, the one called FSK441, it's frequency shift keying, and it's keyed at a rate of 441 uh, switching transitions per second. Uh, each transition actually transmits two bits, so it's 882 bits per second, that's how you get up into this, uh, you know, uh, what is a, a, a bit is sort of, uh, to send a character requires of the order of six bits. So we're talking about character transmission rates of over 140 characters per second. So that's fast enough that it's useful for, uh, for media scatter. There's another version uh, specially optimized for the 50 megahertz band, that's also a scatter uh, technique. There's this band uh, ratio, this uh, protocol called 
JT65 because it uses 65 different tones in the, in the frequency modulation. That's the one that's used for moon bounce. Uh, it's also turned out to be very effective for very low power transmissions uh, around the world on the so-called high frequency bands. Those are at lower frequency than the other bands that I'm talking about. They're the bands that uh, actually reflect off the Earth's ionosphere. And anyway, then there's some other modes. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about Whisper down here uh, when we get to it. So these are just to illustrate the, the uh, different possibilities. Now, let me just say a few words in detail about uh, several of the modes that have uh, characteristics in common. Each one of the modes with these names um, is organized so that uh, each station transmits for one minute, and transmissions always start at the top of a minute <coughs> on the UTC clock. Uh, so both stations have to know what time it is pretty accurately. And one guy will agree to transmit in the even-numbered minutes, and the other one in the odd-numbered minutes. Okay, uh, The tr actual transmissions only last for about 50 seconds rather than a whole minute, so that after the 50th second, the transmitter shuts off, the receiver can then, the receiving computer can then decode whatever it received, the operator can see what, he, what message he received, and can decide what he's going to send back, which will depend on what he received, right? Um, so we, we're going to send compact, structured messages that include things like your call signs and signal reports and maybe some uh, very simple chit-chat like nice to see you again or whatever. Um, and you have to make it compact. I'll, I'll say more about that in a minute. These messages are then transmitted with these very strong error correcting codes so that at the receiving end, the receiving operator will either receive the transmission exactly as it was sent or else it will get nothing at all. Um, so it, there's, the error correction is sort of built into the, into the protocol. So you don't get partial copy ordinarily. You get uh, either 100% copy or zero. Uh, in all of these cases, it turned out, I decided to use uh, multi-tone frequency shift keying, uh, largely because over these transmission paths, uh, the phase of the transmitted signal gets modified by the scattering properties of the meteor trail or by the surface of the moon being irregular. And so phase shift keying, although it would have some other advantages, is basically a non-starter on these methods. Uh, and frequency shift keying works very well, and it uh, then is decoded incoherently. Um, as I mentioned already, we can copy something like 10 to 15 dB, weaker than what would be required for continuous wave Morse code transmissions. Okay? And uh, there are more than 1,000 people around the world that are using this now on the two meter band for doing moon bounce, and there's many thousands of other users uh, on the high frequency bands. Well, you know about Project Diana, that was here. So let me say a few things about moon bounce. That's just the Wikipedia page that uh, has a picture of the, the big antenna that was just down the road here. Um, and many of you probably know more about that than I do in detail. Here's uh, the screen of the software uh, during a basic uh, uh, contact using this protocol, JT65, uh, for a, mean, uh, a moon bounce uh, communication. Uh, and the signals that are decoded here are too small to see, but I've, I've repeated them over here. First of all, there's a CQ uh, by a station in Russia, RU1AA. And the standard message uh, in this protocol is um, a first word, which is usually either CQ or another call sign. The second uh, word is ordinarily your own call sign. And the third word is a four-character sequence that gives your location on the Earth. Uh, KO48 basically tells me where he is in Russia. <laughs> and I can look it up on a map. Uh, so he's calling CQ. That means he's looking for a contact. Uh, I come back. Uh, the, the red transmissions are the ones that I send, so they don't show up here on the screen. Uh, but I come back, I send him my call sign and my grid locator, uh, which is FN20. Central New Jersey is FN20. Um, finally, he comes back, he, he responds, he gives me a signal report, minus 14 dB. That's pretty good. <laughs> okay, I'm a small station. Uh, he's got a big antenna, so that helps. I come back, and he, he's also running a lot of power. I come back and say, oh, you're minus 7. He, he's even a lot stronger. These are signals that are actually, these are strong enough that you could hear them. Uh, 
thumb. I mean, they'd be weak, and they, most people would say, that I just hear noise, but if you concentrate, you can hear those signals. And finally, we exchange a little bit. We've talked to each other before many times. We exchange a little bit of uh, uh, pleasantries, and that's, that's it. So this whole thing, uh, seven messages, is the whole contact. Each message has, uh, what, 10, 12, 13, 14 characters, something like that. So it's not much of a conversation, but it's fun. <laughs> and that's what we did. So these, these modes, once again, are not made for uh, long conversations. OK, um, does it really work? Yeah, it really works. And lots of people have fun with it. Uh, using JT65 with, from my home station now, I've worked, uh, made uh, contact reflected off the moon with all 50 states with 125 different countries, with uh, 36 different so-called zones, which uh, cover the whole world. There's a, there's a total of 40 zones, so I've missed a few. I haven't worked Mongolia, and, you know, uh, Antarctica, whatever. Uh, so anyway, a lot of people are doing this and having a lot of fun. And because, <clears throat> sorry, because the message, uh, the message protocol works so effectively, down to, actually, it's well below minus 20 dB. It, it gets down to more like minus 28 dB. And for that reason, you actually can put together a moon bounce capable station with no more than 100 or 150 watts and an antenna that doesn't look much bigger than a TV antenna. So it's, it's, uh, it's attractive and people have fun doing it. OK, so let's pass on. Let me talk about this uh, mode known as Whisper, um, Weak Signal Propagation Recorder. Uh, QRP is the ham's abbreviation for running low power. So when you do whispering, you typically set your transceiver down to five watts or less. Uh, some people do it with milliwatts. Uh, it doesn't take very much power. Here the transmissions, instead of being one minute long, they're two minutes long. Um, and uh, the program is set up so that it uses a randomized transmit and receive cycle so that um, you transmit something like one two-minute segment out of every five, and you'll receive for the other four of them. But which one the program decides to transmit in will be randomized, so that uh, if you happen to transmit at the same time that some other station uh, on the same frequency was going to be transmitting, you won't always do that. You'll only occasionally do that when the, when the randomization tends to collide. So you have a, if you set it up on a particular M band, there's a tiny little slice of spectrum that's uh, used for this uh, whispering technique. And uh, you'll basically hear all the other stations on that, uh, on that band anywhere in the world if the propagation path is open. And of course, what this is aimed at doing is telling you uh, where the propagation paths may be open. So again, the messages are very simple. It includes your call sign, your locator. Again, this, this tells your uh, uh, two letters and two digits tell your uh, location on the Earth to an accuracy of a few miles. Uh, the, these boxes of, of uh, longitude and latitude are about 60 miles high and 120 miles wide. So it, it localizes you pretty well. And uh, then finally, the message includes a number, which is by convention your transmitter power in decibels above one milliwatt. So the number 30 would be for one watt, 37 is five watts. So I'm, I'm saying that I'm broadcasting from this location with a power of five watts. Uh, again, we're using frequency shift keying, in this case with only four tones. The, the total shift in the frequency of the tones is about one and a half hertz per tone. So the total bandwidth of the signal is only six hertz. These are very, very narrow signals. And in fact, if you listen to the tones that the computer is generating for your whisper transmitter to send out, you basically don't hear any modulation at all. It just sounds like a pure carrier. Um, <clears throat> there, there are very small shifts, but your ear can't detect a shift of only a, a couple of hertz. Again, when the receiving computer uh, decodes such a message, it up, uh, if it's connected to the internet, that, that computer can upload that information to a central database. And uh, there now are close to 200 million spots in that database over a few years. So people are on 24-7, some of them, uh, just seeing what propagation paths are open around the world. And uh, well, here's the program doing its thing. I won't uh, say much more about it. I'll, well, maybe I'll just say one or two things. The, uh, the, the picture in the spectrum here is uh, a frequency time plot. Frequency runs vertically, time runs horizontally. The total range of time here is about half an hour. 
each one of these little vertical strips is one two-minute transmission or one two-minute reception interval. The little green uh, or colored uh, stripes in those are whisper signals. They last for two minutes each. Uh, the vertical green stripes are at the times when I was transmitting, so there's no receive signal there. Instead, there's just a vertical stripe. The total uh, frequency range displayed here is only 200 hertz. Uh, that's a tiny little slice of spectrum. So we hardly occupy any space at all in the ham radio band, only 200 hertz wide. OK, uh, there's the central database. And you can see where the, where the uh, communication channels were open at a given time. <laughs> and this was probably on 20 meters, I don't know, or maybe it was uh, 30 meters. But basically, the, the band was open worldwide at that time. Uh, you can do lots of things by clicking on the map. I won't say uh, too much detail about it. You can uh, tell it to only, I guess this one was for all bands. Uh, the next one uh, was, uh, the map was told to uh, only show me the signals on a certain band. So this is probably 10 megahertz. Uh, you can tell it to only show the uh, signals that involve either transmission or reception by a signal call sign, perhaps your own. And there's when I put, uh, there's central New Jersey, and there I am, and there's where my signal is being heard, uh, or where I am hearing somebody else. And if you click on the little flag that has your own uh, call sign on it, or anybody's call sign, it will pop up a message which tells you all the stations that are hearing you, and all the stations that you are hearing. Uh, so you can, anyway, there's lots of other things you can do. You can click on uh, the database and download the data and play with it. It's kind of fun to do that. The program runs, by the way, on Linux as well as on uh, uh, Windows and Macintoshes, and uh, so people have had fun with any kind of computer. I'm going to skip through a few things here because I think we're getting close to 9 o'clock and some people are going to want to go home. Uh, here's an interesting way to use Whisper for something uh, a little bit out of the ordinary. It turns out um, Whisper is a very powerful, or, or the Whisper software has in it some very powerful tools that you can use for making precision, almost laboratory quality measurements of a frequency. Uh, what I've done here is to measure the uh, uh, apparent dial error of my single sideband transceiver as a function of frequency over the whole high frequency band from essentially the broadcast band down here up to uh, 20 some megahertz. The black dots on here are international time and frequency signals, WWV, CHU in Canada, and so forth. They all fall on a nice straight line, as you would hope they would uh, when you make these measurements. But you'll see the dial error gets bigger at higher frequencies, so it's proportional to frequency. And in fact, you can solve for the slope and the intercept of that line and calibrate your radio. And uh, once you've done that, then you can measure frequencies to an accuracy of a half a hertz or so. Uh, it's kind of fun, the uh, ARRL, the American Radio Relay League, the, international, uh, the national uh, organization that many of us belong to, uh, runs a competition uh, once a year for measuring frequencies. And uh, if you uh, measure all, I think it's seven or eight of the different transmissions that are put on during that evening when that uh, uh, competition is run, if you get them all to within one, her one hertz or better, you get a gold star, basically. And uh, this, this, this program has enabled me to can collect those gold stars a few times, which is, which is a lot of fun. OK, let me say a few things about Moon Bounce now. Um, uh, I said a couple of things about it already. There's another program uh, in addition to WSJT that I call MAP65. It uses this protocol, JT65, but instead of just tuning to one frequency where your transceiver might be uh, have its two and a half kilohertz bandwidth, this is used for, with uh, digital style receiving equipment that can cover a much wider bandwidth. Uh, turns out all of the moon bounce activity on the amateur two meter band happens between about 144.1 and 144 or 160 or so, about a 60 kilohertz range. MAP65 is designed to um, receive that whole range and decode all the, all the JT65 signals in that range. Uh, and it does so in a way that uh, takes advantage of uh, polarization uh, diversity. Uh, so you need two receivers, basically. 
you need both a horizontal and a vertical polarized antenna. Uh, many of us have those. Uh, they're good for moon bounce because the signal that goes out and the signal that comes back ordinarily have different polarization because of rotation through the ionosphere. And uh, anyway, this, this basically enables you to solve for that polarization angle for each one of the signals that you may be receiving over that 60 kilohertz range. Now, for the annual uh, moon bounce contest, uh, this is a real advantage. You get to see all the signals on there, basically, and, and to uh, call the ones that you haven't talked to yet. So in comparing WSJT with MAP65, here are the basic differences. The, the, the more uh, uh, the wideband program looks over a bandwidth up to 90 kilohertz instead of only a couple of kilohertz for the ordinary one. Uh, it works only on the JT65 mode instead of the various other modes that the other program will do. The other program decodes only one signal, but this one decodes all the signals in the passband, so you can see all those different things that may be on at the same time, and it does this polarization matching. Uh, so it, it's a, uh, a, a, a significant uh, tool, and, and people have a lot of fun playing with it. These, this, this program now also is used by many, many hands around the world. Here it is when in, in, in operation. Um, you can't see very well uh, some of the things that are displayed, but I think, yeah, the next slide shows you that in a 10-minute interval, uh, back in November 2006, during the ARRL's annual moon bounce contest, in 10 minutes it decoded, what, uh, 40 or 50 different call signs from people around the world, all those signals coming off the moon uh, as reflections. It, it basically just gives you a map of where they are on the band, so if, if I realize that I haven't uh, talked to EA6VQ yet, I, I, turned to, I tuned to 144, 139 and give him a call, <laughs> okay? There you are. Uh, okay, uh, most recently, there's a, an expanded or experimental version of the WSJT program that we've been calling WSJTX. Uh, the target usage in this case is not moon bounce or meteor scatter, but it's just plain old high frequency uh, DXing, uh, but with low power. Uh, so we're going to use uh, 5 watts or maybe 10 watts or something like that, and maybe a, a a dipole in your attic because you're in a antenna restricted community and you can't put something up on the roof or in the trees. Uh, but still, you can work the world with uh, WSJTX uh, by uh, taking advantage of these coding techniques and so forth. So, uh, there are just a few of its features that are outlined there. It works together with some other popular ham radio uh, software uh, in ways that I'll show you in a second. Here it is running uh, in my station. So here's the WSJTX program. It's a, a program called JT Alert, which uh, was written by a guy in Australia to work together with these JT programs. Uh, what it does is uh, listen, uh, it basically snoops the output from the decoder on the WSJT program, looks at the call signs that are being decoded, and alerts me if, it, uh, if there's a country there that I haven't got in my log yet, or, or you know, that sort of thing. It'll beep at you or, or flash the screen or things like that. So that, that yeah, so that's, that's very clever. It works together with some other, other popular program like a, a logger and a, one that controls your radio. I won't say much more about those. Now this, this uh, software also uh, uploads the decoded signals to a central database. This one uh, is called PSK Reporter because it operates with the popular uh, mode called PSK31, as well as the JT modes and some other ones. And uh, so there, actually, I made that slide just this afternoon. Um, so it's daylight in in, uh, in North and South America, but it's already nighttime in Europe and Asia. And you can see the band is still open across here. Here, are the colors of the lines uh, indicate the band. Uh, yellow is 20 meters. Uh, green is, is 30 meters. Uh, darker green is, is uh, 40 meters. Pink is, is uh, 10 meters, so the band was still open on 10 meters to Europe, but it wouldn't be for many more uh, hours here. The sun's already gone down over there. Good, good north-south propagation on, on 10 meters as well. And we're actually also, from the west coast at least, uh, working in the Japan on 20 meters at this time. Uh, so at this point uh, this afternoon, there were something like 450 stations on 
um, using the JT65 mode, and there they all are, talking to each other. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, here, here's the program operating. You can, it actually displays a, a spectrogram of the signal. Uh, my uh, HF uh, transceiver, which is a Kenwood TS2000, uh, can be opened up so that its bandwidth is about four kilohertz. So this is the four, uh, the, the full four kilohertz here, from zero to 400, uh, 4,000. Uh, it's that full bandwidth. And all these signals over here on the left are JT65 signals. All these signals over on the right are JT9 signals. That's another one of these modes that we've been experimenting with recently, and a lot of people are using it now around the world. One of the big differences is the bandwidth is much smaller on these, so you can get a lot more of them in without them running into each other the way they do at the lower, uh, on the, uh, the other mode. Remember, this mode was designed really for moon bounce, even though it's widely used now on the high frequency band as well. Uh, so what have I not said yet? Um, I, I think I'd, I'd like to wind this up and actually give some time for a Q&A, so maybe I'll just say a few more things. I mentioned this uh, VK3 AMA program called uh, JT Alert. So it gives you audio or visual alerts on a special call sign, a, a special locator, a special country, a zone, a state. Uh, it does automatic logging for you and, uh, and so forth. Um, I mentioned a couple of the differences between these two modes. Again, mainly it's a bandwidth difference, only, 100, only 15 hertz instead of 170 something hertz. Uh, nothing much else to say there. I'll just summarize here about the, uh, the, the uh, sensitivities of these various different digital protocols. Uh, the, the amount of uh, signal to noise ratio in a 2500 hertz bandwidth that you need in order to carry on a voice conversation is well, at a bare minimum, something like 3 dB positive. You can just then hear a signal, and maybe if you're concentrating, you can pull a call letter out of the, uh, out of the noise or something. That's about the limit. The meteor scatter mode gets you down a little bit below the noise. With Morse code, you can get down to something like 15 dB if you're a really good operator. Uh, and then you can see these other modes get down to you know, well below that. So we're talking about the whisper mode at the very bottom, down to minus 28 or so. Uh, that's why it works with five watts around the world, because you're able to deal with these signals at a very weak level. And that, again, is because of the efficient coding and the error control coding that are put into it. Um, the software is all uh, open source. Uh, if you're into, into computers at all, you can download the source code. You can play with it. You can recompile it for yourself. You can change it around. Some people have done that. And uh, there are actually a number of other people that are contributing to it recently. That's, that's fun as well. And we're learning a lot from each other. Uh, I'm not really a computer programmer, but I did a lot of programming as part of my physics research. And, and uh, so I've learned a lot more about it when, when doing these things. And I think uh, that's basically the end of what I wanted to say. It's been really great being with you here. And I'd be very happy to open the floor to questions. Thanks for your <laughs> Okay, yep. Now, what kind of computing power do you need to accomplish? Uh, this is a perfectly ordinary uh, uh, modern computer. I mean, and, and in fact, a 10-year-old computer is fine. Uh, the, the original software ran fine on a Pentium 1 or even on a 486, uh, but nobody has those anymore. So, anyway, yeah. 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 I, that doesn't run on your iPhone, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, right. 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 Yeah, you probably should. Maybe like 40 watts or would that be? Yeah, that, that, that'll get you some contacts. You're going to do it on 1296? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You'd be better off with uh, 100 watts or yeah. whatever, but 40 watts would be a good start. And you can work some of the big stations with that. Be yeah, and that, that will help for sure. Good. Yeah. Can you give us a feel for the uncorrected error rate on some of these systems? Yeah, well, um, <coughs> 
the, the signal to noise ratio in the detection bandwidth, which is only a few hertz, obviously has to be greater than zero. I mean, uh, greater than one as a ratio. And, and uh, um, it doesn't have to be very much greater than one. So if you're getting an error rate of 20% of or so, that's OK. That'll be correctable. Uh, and that will come out with, with perfect copy. The, and, and you can play with that as part of the design uh, uh, goals of, of what you can, you know, what kind of redundancy level you're going to build into the code. Um, and so I've, I've taken a couple of cracks at it, and I don't necessarily have an optimum, but it's probably, it probably brackets the optimum range. Sure. Uh, you mentioned he has an version of the sports spec. But with 25 hertz, and what do you do? It seems like you could put a CDMA or something in there. What was your objection to spread spectrum? Uh, no, you, you, there are spread spectrum techniques that, that you could use, but the, the weak signal portions of the VHF bands are, are basically organized by hands to use either uh, really narrow band stuff like Morse CW or single side band of a couple of kilohertz. And, and you can certainly use uh, spread spectrum techniques within that couple of kilohertz. Yeah, you're not, I mean, your, your, your nearby neighbors are not going to like you if you have a 200, hertz, a 200 kilohertz wide signal in the weak signal part of the band. If, if you could guarantee you would always be weak, then you, nobody would care. But you're not going to be weak with your neighbors. <laughs> OK, well, maybe we can have some uh, private conversations, too. But thanks a lot for your attention tonight. Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh, super. QST November 19th. November 23. Great. That's to do with that, uh, buy me a new hat. Thank you much, very much, Richard. I'll, I'll enjoy it. Okay.